And first of all, great to uh, see the PNG chapters and the alumni uh, grow on the strengths and strengths under uh, Ed's leadership and you, Nikki, and obviously uh, David's uh, stewardship. And uh, congratulations also using this moment to all the award winners, especially to my friend Claude Meyer. I'm personally uh, very closely involved in his project of constellations, and it's definitely worth listening to and, more importantly, uh, supporting. The title that you've chosen for the conference couldn't be better, Our Best Self. Uh, I'll talk that in a minute, why that is so important, because any change that we need right now, and do we need changes, has to start with the individual itself. And I'm keen to talk to you because you have a uh, commu community of 40 to 50,000 alumni, and if we could just not only unlock our best selves, but if we could connect that, then it becomes an incredible force for change and hopefully a force for good. And that's really what this is all about. The, the famous African proverb that alone we can go fast, but together we can go far is now needed more than ever. I just came from Glasgow, where we've been for the last eight or nine days trying to work on the climate change agreements. The uh, negotiations are still going on. But it's very clear, first and foremost, that the science has spoken, that we have a big issue, and this is a crucial moment in history that we have the opportunity to address that. But it requires the best of all of us. We all know the challenges. I don't want to spend too much time on that. But our global economic system is broken. Our societies are being pulled apart on every measure, if you want to, inequality or poverty or injustice or food security. The numbers are now worse than before. And frankly, uh, before the pandemic, we weren't in a very good position either. Uh, the, the COVID pandemic itself, I believe, has put a magnifying glass on the issues that we knew we were there, but perhaps didn't have the courage to attack. And we know these issues are complex. Above all, COVID has shown that we can't have healthy people on an unhealthy planet. COVID has pointed out this interrelationship between biodiversity or biodiversity destruction, human health, the economy, climate change, the racial dimensions that have come up. And that makes it all the more important that we attack them. One of the things that is coming out very clearly is that we're living well beyond our planetary boundaries. This is not a surprise COVID. We've had enormous amounts of zoonic diseases, SARS, Ebola, Zika, Asian flu, all direct consequences from us destroying nature. And destroying nature, we do. Uh, World's World Overshoot Day, which is the day that we used up more resources than the world can replenish, was this year, July 29th which means that every day after that, we're actually stealing from future generations. 68% of our species, mammals, reptiles, have disappeared over the last five decades alone. Some people call it the sixth biggest extinction. We've lost over half the forests in this world. In fact, as I talk, one million species are at risk. When is it our turn? A philosopher on the other side of the border there, I don't know if you guys are in the US right now, but in Canada, is called Hubert Reeves. And Hubert said it well when he said, man is the most insane species. He worships an invisible God, but destroys a visible nature, not realizing that the visible nature he destroys is the invisible God he worships in the first place. And if that wasn't enough, we normally rely on our politicians to deal with these challenges. And they've done that reasonably well as we lifted enormous amounts of people out of poverty over the last few decades. But it's also clear right now that by not addressing these burning issues in the many opportunities that we've had to deal with them, our political system has become equally stuck. Our national governments are paralyzed by frankly self-interests and our global governance structure is absolutely unable to bring solutions to these increasingly shared challenges. Our global institutions were designed in 1944 by Bretton Woods, and we frankly haven't adjusted them since. So you can look no further than the unfair distribution of COVID, where 5% of the emerging countries have the, uh, received the vaccines, whilst we're all already in 70% plus and, and talking the boosters. You can look at it in money that we're willing to dish out to help these emerging markets deal with the devastating effects of climate change that we have created and our inability to even come up with 100 billion when we spent 100 times more than that on COVID in our own countries. Last month, the IPCC confirmed 
that frankly we don't have until 2050 to deal with this man-made challenge of global warming. We don't even have 2040. We need to solve it before a real deadline of 2030, where we need to cut our emissions by about half. This is not something that can wait till the last day. It's a cumulative issue. Now, almost everyone expects that business cannot sit on the sidelines here. Business needs to get involved as much as the world needs business to get involved itself. Business needs to be out there as a force for good. I've always said that business cannot succeed in failing societies, nor can business be a bystander in a system that gives it life in the first place. Whilst most of us are moving, we're clearly not moving at the scale and speed that is needed. Again, very transparent in Glasgow, millions and millions of young people are in the streets and millions others make their voices heard at the polls or in any other way they can. We as industry leaders have an enormous responsibility to work individually and together to drive these tipping points and frankly, give our politicians the courage and the confidence to make the bolder commitments as well. Now, this is very much what we're trying to do at the COP26 with these uh, commitments like the race to zero, the race to zero breakthrough. I have to say I've never seen so many businesses being represented there, over 5,000 of them, most having made commitments one way or another to fight climate change, forming these partnerships, increasingly around things, not only energy transition, but also nature-based solutions, for example, absolutely crucial to uh, attack the issue of climate change. And one reason the business is getting involved, the financial community is waking up, is that we're at a point that the cost of action is actually significantly lower than the cost of inaction. We've spent already in Europe and the US alone, just on COVID, $17 trillion to save lives and livelihoods. The IMF estimates that our global GDP is go has lost about $27 trillion in uh, this decade as a result of COVID. Therefore, with these enormous costs, people are realizing when the cost of inaction is higher than the cost of action, turn that around and it becomes an enormous business opportunity. And that's why we're rapidly moving from risk mitigation to opportunity seizing. And companies that understand that will do well. Study after study is now showing that a greener future is not only better for mankind and better for the planet and better for future generations, but it is also the growth story of the century. The multi-stakeholder, purpose-driven, longer-term models are actually the more profitable models. I think that's one of the reasons you've seen the financial market moving up and actually accelerating. Contrary to what people thought when COVID was started, when many of the cynics or skeptics were saying ESG is dead, governments will not spend time on climate mitigation, we've actually seen the opposite. We've seen an acceleration. ESG funds are estimated to be $50 trillion uh, by 2025. Uh, governments have moved their commitments from 20% before COVID to 85% of the government saying now we want to be net zero by 2050, i.e. staying in the one and a half degree warming. We've never seen such a step change. And for the ones that don't move by themselves, and there are some, or that don't move fast enough, I think the pressure is building. In Glasgow alone, we saw over $130 trillion, half the world's capital, making commitments to be net zero. I agree with you that the financial community is not always driven by morality, but they're certainly driven now by the opportunities. We have consumers increasingly asking for the right products. We have people in the street, the millennials or the Gen Zs, we're out by the hundreds of thousands, striking every Friday now. We feel the cost, every business feels the cost of nature or nature losses actually in their business models. $45 trillion of nature-based solutions are actually directly related to businesses. And I don't think there's any business that hasn't noticed the effects of climate change. And if you're not convinced and can see the, the writing on the wall and you're still belonging to the people that are sitting on the fence or that are outright cynics, uh, listen to your children, listen to your employees. Every company now has a greater thorn burn. People are willing to go on strike or walk out now. And if you don't do that, 
listen to the employees. I think many of the fossil fuel companies are discovering that they have to make a choice to be a good dad uh, for their children or to frankly have their children disown them. The beauty now is that it's within our reach to act. Again, confirmed study after study that we still have that window of opportunity provided we act now. And technology is mostly on our side. We always underestimate how fast technology goes. 80% of the targets that we need to achieve between now and 2030 are available uh, with technology that is currently available at a cost that is already lower than we're currently playing. So it's not surprising that the smart ones in the private sector are picking up on that one and that we're seeing these increased commitments and increased actions uh, that we could not have dreamt of, in all honesty, a few years ago. But I, as I mentioned, the speed with which we're going is simply not fast enough. 16% increase is what we see in climate change in the next 10 years based on the submissions of all the country plans, whilst we need a 45% decline. Whilst most of the countries, uh, companies, whilst most of the companies have made commitments to reduce climate change, only 15%, one five, had made commitments that is in line with what science requires us to do. Many of the companies make commitments on scope one and two, but are not willing to go where the bigger carbon emissions are, which is scope three or beyond. 85%, as I said, to 90% of the governments have made commitments, but very few have put clear plans in place what they're going to do to reduce between now and 2030. So this is where the book comes in. This is where net positive comes in. The reason we wrote net positive, and I wrote it with my good friend, Andrew Winston, who also has written two other books, uh, From Green to Gold and The Big Pivot, that really have made an impression on me. And I was fortunate enough that he agreed to write it with me. And what we're really talking about is, is uh, a very simple question that we're posing. How can companies profit, not from creating the world's problems, but from solving the world's problems? With a very simple follow-up question, that is the world better off because your company is in it, yes or no? And any transformation that is now needed has to go through a personal or leadership transformation to get to a organizational transformation that ultimately results in a systems transformation. And this is why your leadership uh, conference, if you want to, is uh, of so importance. So the uh, the book has um, it built on a, on a very simple premise of this July 29th overshoot day, if I may make it simple. Most of the companies are in the less bad space or CSR space. I'm going to reduce my carbon emissions. I'm going to get a little bit more sustainable sourcing. I'm going to reduce my plastics in the oceans. Very much the commitments we saw in Glasgow as well. But think about this. You killed 10 people, you were a murderer. Then you started to decide to only kill five people. Are you a better murderer? When we are overshooting these planetary boundaries, frankly, less bad is simply not good enough. Okay, I get it, most of the CEOs say. I want to be sustainable. I want to be net zero, neither good nor bad. A very applaudable position to be in. But the reality is when we overshoot these boundaries, when we're close to these negative tipping points, we can't afford it anymore. It's like saying, okay, I can build a coal plant in Kentucky, and after people live around it, lose the life expectancy or decrease their life expectancy by 12 years because I'm planting some trees in the Sahara or I'm saving this forest, but I'm cutting down another forest somewhere else. Net zero doesn't work. Sustainability being not good, not bad is an interim step, but not the end step. Instead, the companies that survive in the future have to think regenerative, restorative, reparative. And that we call net positive. And what this book is trying to do very simply and very powerfully is bring that concept of regeneration that is so well embedded in nature into the world that we have created. The argument is very simple, that companies that become net positive will thrive and companies that don't, I think, will end up on the graveyard of dinosaurs. We're basically putting to bed this dogmatism of Milton Friedman's shareholder primacy and short-termism and change with a powerful mindset I think what the standard of business needs to be. The overall definition in the book for us is a business that improves the well-being of everyone it impacts and at all scales, be it every product, every operation, every region, every 
uh, country, every stakeholder. And for us, the stakeholders are not only your employees or your suppliers or your communities or your customers, but they are also the planet and future generations. The characteristics of net positive companies are companies that take responsibility of their total handprint in society, not just their footprint. All responsibilities, intended or not, where companies like Facebook go wrong is, yeah, they have a wonderful platform, has a lot of benefits. But if you don't take responsibility for the hate speech, for the children getting addicted to your media, for the undermining of democracy efforts that are happening on your platform, you're missing a key point. They operate for the long-term benefit of business and society. And they do that by understanding that it requires a positive return for all of the stakeholders. In fact, they firmly believe that the shareholder return is a result of what you do, not a goal by itself. Of course, you need profits, but profits is like white blood cells in your body. You don't, nobody lives for white blood cells. Nobody lives for profits alone. There is a deeper meaning, and these net positive companies understand that. And last but not least, these companies participate in the broader systems changes that society is, is needing. They take a full responsibility of all their social and environmental impacts. They work with all of the stakeholders. They work in these broader partnerships. And yes, they face these tougher challenges. They understand that it has to be consistent. We have a little chapter that is called elephants in the room. But how do you deal with tax? How do you deal with corruption, human rights, CEO salaries, uh, money in politics, um, the uh, trade associations. We have wonderful companies now in the US making amazing climate commitments, but then they let their trade associations loose to lobby to the tune of billions of dollars to undermine the legislation that is needed. People see through this. The world has become more transparent. That consistency is important. I certainly don't pretend it's easy. Unilever wasn't perfect. I think nobody is perfect. But this is not only the path of relevance that we need to put businesses on. This is what is absolutely needed to create the peace and prosperity that this world is looking for. Many businesses are moving. We see many great leaders, but we still have to find more that have that courage and that, uh, that stronger sense of purpose, if I may. As I said, it is a human transformation. And that is why the most important element, actually, is not technology or other things. We've actually never been so forewarned about what is going to happen, but also forearmed with tools to do something about it. The main missing currency is actually courageous leadership. We actually, we actually have a lack of this. Uh, Romney said it well. Romney, when he is an Iranian um, poet who said that, yesterday I was clever, so I wanted to change the world. Today I'm wise. So I'm changing myself. And that's where the spirit of net positive starts. I hope you'll have an opportunity to read the book. It's off to a good start. But our real idea is here to start a movement, a movement for the future of capitalism, a movement for humanity, and a movement for the planet and future generations. It is tough, but as Mandela said, it always looks impossible until it's done. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Paul. Yeah. I have the book. I pre-order it, arrived in Greece, and I'm going to start reading it. Um, we have a few questions, and we have questions also from the audience. But I want to start with a very disruptive one. And this is a hypothetical one. So what if, for a week, we could replace all politicians and all CEOs globally uh, with decision makers that they were mothers, mothers of newborns. What type of decisions would have taken differently than the current trajectory? Well, I think that is a very good and provocative question, and <laughs> I hope it's not hypothetical in one, one uh, day or another in the future, because what we find, uh, Nikki, is that that already now with hard facts that companies that are more diverse in all its senses, for example, more women on board, more women in management, are the companies that actually are performing better as well. In Unilever, I immediately moved to a 50% women and men 
uh, boards of, of all different uh, nationalities, people of color, etc. I moved the company to 50% uh, gender diversity, and we did that without rewards or incentives. We just said that's the norm we're going to operate under, and we are so much better for it. In Unilever's case, it was a 300% return on, on for our shareholders. In the countries where we saw women prime ministers, and I'm talking about Iceland, Norway, Denmark, um, uh, uh, Finland, uh, New Zealand, where we had women leaders, we actually saw that they were dealing with COVID better than some of these populist governments where people actually denied the science and have literally been responsible for, lo for many people losing their lives. We see it also in parliaments, when we have more women in parliaments in the countries that we look at with, uh, with the UN on the Sustainable Development Goals. I, I chair the UN Global Compact for the Secretary General, but we see that the countries that have more women in parliament are also countries with a higher level of trust with society that are moving to these more inclusive, sustainable and equitable business models moving forward. So getting that fairer representation I don't think you necessarily need to have a baby or having used pampers, but moving to that fairer representation is certainly one thing to unlock. And it makes economic sense. McKinsey estimated that um, just if we would give women equal access to financing, land rights and education, we could unlock the global economy by over $20 trillion, five times more than what it takes to implement the Sustainable Development Goals. So. This makes sense from a lot of perspectives. Let's get on with it. Sounds Thank great. you so Thank much, you. Paul. I, uh, Question from the audience. Yeah, Valerie, do you want to yes. shoot? Paul, thank you so much. Congratulations on the release of your book, and thank you for what it's going to do for uh, society. I see a question from our audience, uh, Gina Lam, an alum. Yeah, Gina Lam, yeah. Can you Can talk have... about the B Corp badge to help companies commit to the to future of good and the movement? Can it be boosted with more teeth? The B Corp badge. Um, no, absolutely. And I've been an active supporter of the B Corp. I've launched it in several countries. As Unilever, we bought some of the B Corp corporations like Ben & Jerry, Seventh Generation, Puka, and many others, and they're doing extremely well. What you find is really that companies that really integrate in, into their core strategies, sustainability and purpose, that operate under these longer term models is really uh, also a, a a better way to get, to get performance if you want to. And the B Corp is really started and it's really in, in about 60 states in, uh, sorry, in uh, over 30 states in the US. Uh, we have over 5,000 companies now that are B Corp status or are applying for it, but it also, um, starts from a corporate charter. In many companies still, there is this feeling that the fiduciary duties of the boards are to their shareholders, and often the boards are being called out as the reason for the short-termism that has crept into the business world. 75% of CEOs say that the short-term pressure is actually coming from the boards, not from the financial market. So the B Corp really has another corporate um, fiduciary duty towards your multiple stakeholders. Uh, that concept is broadly uh, embraced in some countries in Europe already in law. Uh, the B Corp movement creates that broader awareness, especially in countries like the US. Until now, it was really given to smaller companies, often new enterprises that started. But increasingly, we're trying to see, can we apply these principles as well to the uh, bigger companies to have that uh, broader impact? Ultimately, every company needs to operate under these principles and then some. Now, the interesting thing is here again, we have the hard facts. If you look at a recent study from Deloitte, it said that it, it concluded that mission driven companies that also have actually a higher innovation, about 30 percent higher, higher employment retention, 40 percent higher, higher engagement, and as a result, higher return on equity, higher total shareholder return. In fact, in their study, it showed 50 percent over five year periods. We see the same with ESG. Companies with that are run under these longer term uh, formats and, and you look at the Russell 1000 index, they're outperforming their peers by over 30% in the last four years. And I think Unilever or 
uh, PNG have some of the hallmarks of that. So it's backed up by hard data, and I think we would be wise to take notice of that. Paul, I think we need to have uh, just one conference only on talking on, on the subject of net positive, because this is so important to bring awareness to uh, business owners, small business owner, uh, CEOs, and the world at large. I cannot thank you with Valerie Moore for being with us today and spreading the word of being net positive. Thank you and thank you for your great work. Uh, the world needs what you do. Thanks for the opportunity. Above all, be safe. And uh, this is the moment. We can't let anybody down, not our current youth, nor future generations. As uh, Mantari, uh, Wangari Mantai said it very well, that she said that in, uh, in the course of history, there comes a time when humanity is called upon to shift to a higher level of consciousness, to reach a, to reach a higher moral ground, as she called it. I just wanted to simply end by telling you that time is now. Be safe and hopefully see you all soon again. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thank much, you. Paul. Thank you.